Good morning, members. Welcome to this multi-locational meeting of the Corporate Health and Safety Committee being held in the Chamber Penalta House and via Microsoft Teams on Monday, the 18th of July, 2022. Just to confirm that this meeting will be live streamed and recorded and made available to view via the Council's website, except for discussions involving confidential or exempt items. Therefore, images, audio of those individuals present and or speaking will be publicly available to all via the recording on the Council's website. If members lose connection during the meeting, please make every attempt to reconnect. However, the meeting will continue as long as it remains correct. Committee services staff are available and will be able to assist you to reconnect if necessary. I wish to also remind everyone that the chair has the discretion to terminate or suspend the webcast <coughs> if in their opinion, continuing to do so would prejudice the proceedings or that continued webcasting might infringe the rights of any individual. The chair also has the right to remove persons from the physical and from the digital meeting link if that is necessary. Members attending remotely, please leave on your cameras, but mute your microphones. Members attending physically, please use the chamber's microphones when you are called on to speak. Members and officers should only activate their microphones after the chair has invited them to speak on an item. Today, we'll be using Microsoft Forms voting on agenda items, where the voting poll will appear and then members are asked to click on a yes, no abstain and then click on submit vote. If you have any problems accessing the voting pop up, please indicate and your vote can be taken verbally. Members, we are welcoming new councillors to today's meeting. Once the appointment of chair and vice chair have been made, I'm sure that the newly appointed chair will want to welcome everyone formally to the committee. We will now take a roll call of attendees. I'll start with councillors. Uh, Councillor Adams. Present. Councillor Chacon Dawson. Councillor Chapman. Present. Councillor Enright. Present. Councillor Kent. Councillor Sadler. Councillor Williams. Present. If I move on to trade union representatives, we have apologies from Neil Fennell. Juan Garcia. Present. Leanne Dallimore. Sends it apologies. Gary Parr. Present. Thank you. We've had apologies from the following officers, Richard Edmonds, Dave Beecham, Paul Cryer and Sue Richards. Uh, Emma Townsend, myself present. Lynn Donovan. Present, Emma. Kerry Edwards. Mark Williams has left the authority. Andrew Wigley. Yeah, I'm present. Mike Heddington. Good morning, Emma. Yes, I'm present. And Alison Evans and John Ullman have also been invited. Thank you. First on our agenda for this meeting is to appoint and chair for the following year. Members, do we have a nomination for chair? Uh, Mike Adams, say support. Fantastic, thank you. Having been moved and seconded, seconded, we will move the vote and I can confirm that Councillor Adams has been appointed as Chair of Corporate Health and Safety Committee for the ensuing year. I will now hand over the rest of the meeting procedures to the Chair. You want mute, Councillor? Still on mute, councillor. Could so you couldn't hear that, could you? I okay. Think so. That's okay now, though. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. 
members, officers and other staff, and uh, also to anyone listening. Yes, this is a new committee. We will now enter the part where I'll be looking for a vice chair for the ensuing year. And uh, do we have any nominations for that? And we can nominate people in their absence uh, if, if we need to. I would nominate Councillor Steve Kent, who's unfortunately not with us today, and I don't think he's given any apologies, but um, in my experience, he's been an excellent uh, vice chair and as a standing as chair over the last few years. So I'm, I, I hope he will accept that nomination in his absence. Anyone else want to second that? Second that, Chair. Thank you, Walter. Any other nominations for Vice Chair? No. OK, thanks all. Can, uh, as we have only that one nomination, uh, can we accept that in his absence? I believe we can. Yeah, I've not advised otherwise. Thank you very much, uh, members. So Steve Kent will be advised that he has been elected as the Vice Chair for the coming year. Right, now we have a number of uh, new members. Rob, Gary, Marina. So this is going to be, and uh, Jim Sadler, this is going to be a, a quite a new way that these reports are delivered for you. They are always interesting and wide ranging, and we have uh, some excellent officers to deliver those reports to you. So look forward to all the health and safety meetings for the next year. Uh, I've always enjoyed them, and I'm sure confident that uh, you will yourselves. I'll now go over to the agenda proper. I can find it. Let's get that. There we go. So we are on the agenda. Emma has kindly read out some of the conditions that we need to abide by uh, for the agenda meeting. And uh, let's get that back up. There we go. And first is to appoint a chair, which we've done, and then the vice chair, which we've done. Uh, apologies for absence. We've had a number, I think, uh, this evening. Emma has also gone through the roll call for those in attendance. So item four is the declarations of interest. Councillors and officers are reminded of their personal responsibility to declare any personal and or prejudicial interest in respect of any item of business on this agenda in accordance with the Local Government Act 2000, the Council's Constitution and the Code of Conduct for both councillors and officers. Are there any declarations of interest either from in the Chamber members or online? None that I'm aware of. OK, thank you, members. We now go to approve and sign the following minutes. The Corporate Health and Safety Committee held on the 14th of February 2022. So that's five months away. OK, I'll go through them, the pages for accuracy. I know a number of you won't really be able to comment because of the new members, so it'll be when we get to the end, a quite a short vote, but uh, page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, and finally, page six. Can we now have a the voting panel up for the minutes of 
for the 14th of February. Just a, we're just doing a hands up for that one. So let's go back to that. OK, members. Chair, can, can I just interject? Uh, I've got my hand up. I don't know if you can see it. Yes, I, I can now. Yes, I just come back to that screen, Gary. Thanks. Am I OK to come in? Yes, yes. Yeah, just an observation. Obviously, I wasn't at the last meeting. Um, observation is around verbal reports. Never been a fan of them. They have their place. Clearly for a committee of um, this status, uh, the number of items we've got to discuss, I would respectfully request that they are kept to a minimum, especially in light of the last minutes. You had risk management, um, statutory maintenance. Yep. It doesn't give any time whatsoever to critique or offer an observation. And for me personally, if somebody's talking to me for 20 minutes, they've probably lost me after a few minutes. So if we can keep them to a minimum, that would be really grateful. We will certainly take that suggestion on board and discuss that um, with Eva and her team and see how we can come back on that one and uh, keep you informed as well, Gary. Great stuff. Thanks, Chair. OK, then thanks. So can we now vote on the minutes? And please, if you just put your hand up or if you like your, there we go, we've got um we've got hands up uh, off the system which which do you want to do members but you chair uh garcia yeah. got his hand up to speak i think is it to speak not to vote uh Juan? no i'm voting chair it, it was it was it was to vote let's all do the same use your 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 hands up function There we go. Keep on going. Hands up function. No. Jim, you'll have to use your hands up function because we won't be able to see you on screen anyway if you put your hand up. Okay, sorry, yep. Julie from Committee Services. The only members that would be able to vote agree at the minute would be the members who were at the last meeting. Oh, yes, so agree yes. With that's um, right. Yeah, thank which, you. Which is Councillor Williams, myself, and uh, Steve Kent, who's not uh, with us anyway. So that, that's carried by, by two, two members, unfortunately, at this time. OK, thanks for that advice, uh, Julie. So that is uh, passed. Uh, we now go on to the item number six, updated violence at work policy. And that's being presented by, is it Emma? Yes, Councillor Adams, back to me, unfortunately. No, 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 go ahead then, Emma. OK, so this report introduces the violence at work policy. Um, this is not a new policy, it is an update of our existing policy. Um, it is a key and very important policy in setting the authorities' commitment, responsibilities and control measures for managing the risks associated with violence in the workplace. So the amendments are relatively minor and they include wording updates, uh, a merging of the policy and corporate management arrangements into one document for ease of use. And we've also included the Employee Protection Register procedure as an appendix to the policy. So members are asked to consider and comment on the policy before comments go back to corporate management team and we seek approval and introduction of this revised draft. Thank you, Emma. We have the report in front of us, uh, members, and uh, we have the violence at work policy of Caffili Borough Council. That's followed uh, by some addendas, addendums. Um, have we got any questions on that, or do do we we need to actually move the report in its first instance before I open it up to questions? Uh, anyone like to? move that in 
regard to the recommendations to commend, comment on the report and provide feedback as they deem necessary. And then any feedback from the committee will be submitted along with the report, as Emma just said, to a future CMT. Anyone like to move the report? Thank you, Marina. Seconded? Second, Jim. Thank you, Walter. Now that that's been moved and seconded, are there any questions, members? I've got a number of questions, Chair. I've got my hand up, but again, I don't know oh, if you can see again, me. No, I, I, because I'm looking at the uh, report itself, but uh, uh, that's covering some of the the uh, the screen for the, the meeting itself. I'll go back to that. I can see that we have now three. I'll take my hand off. Gary first, and then we have uh, uh, Juan, who will follow Gary. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Chair. It's just a couple of observations, really, more than anything. With the covering report, again, I think it would help me if these are minor adjustments of wording or phrases, if they can be bolded within the initial report so we can actually see the changes, because it will save me reading six, seven, nine, ten pages when there might have just been and but added. So if that can be done, that would be really, really helpful. Moving into the violence of work policy, if if I can be indulged, there are a number of areas that I think it needs to be tweaked or somebody look at. Um, it's more fine tuning than anything, but the attention is always in the detail. So I'm on page 10, top right hand side. You're yeah. still looking at August 2021 when uh, that date should be changed to July 2022. Yes, those yeah. are the so little bits that really are important when we refer back on yeah absolutely because they can be picked up page 11 um item number 2.1 somebody needs to re look at that because there are one or two words missing doesn't read right especially directed towards employees unacceptable i think there's a couple of words missing there maybe one yeah uh page 12 4.4.2 um with my old hat on, I would always suggest that you use a phrase here that this list is not exhaustible. That's right. Um, because I, I see a number of areas there that, you know, if I, I could challenge. Clearly, I can't punch you in the face, but I can scram you, pull you to the ground, start pulling your clothes. Uh, so yeah. I think if that phrase goes in there, it's a belt and braces. Um, right. Gary, yes, that's uh, very acceptable, I'm sure. Page 13, 6.3.2, we then lose everything then, and it goes to 6.3.7. So whether we've lost four paragraphs or whether the number in is a little bit out. Um, also, the formatting looks a little bit squiffy. It's pulling to the left, pulling to the right, so that needs to be re-looked at. Um, there's also a number of full stops that are appeared within. So clearly it's a copy and paste. Sentences have been taken out. Oh, I'm not sure where everyone's gone. Never mind, I'll carry on. Um, sentences have been taken out, but there are a number of um, full stops where they shouldn't be. So if somebody can go through that, that would be great. 14, 15 are good. Page 16, 7.3.1. The next paragraph doesn't have a number after it, so it's lost the formatting again. So it starts in the event of a violent incident. There's no number in there. 7.3.3 there's words missing again so it's to the bottom end of the paragraph yeah 17's fine 18 i can't get any of the links to open i'm sure it's just my laptop and i'm sure the links work fine so that's just an observation but the content of the policy is fine for me okay yeah but with uh, lots of work for us to uh, to go through just to make sure that uh, we pull ourselves up on things. We don't want others to have to come back in to do that uh, as well, do we? Absolutely. OK, and Juan? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I have discussed some of these points already going through and we have been through this policy uh, in, in detail um, uh, regarding the, the, the content. Um, 
and we did raise a few points at that point. But for the, for the sake of this committee, I think that um, we need to look again with, and I think it's some extra guidance, um, especially around um, training, and I'll draw you to the words trained appropriately. Um, within schools, we're seeing a high volume of, of, of violence towards TAs, teachers from, from pupils and very young pupils. And I think that um, whilst this policy does cover um, in, in essence uh, what is needed to do to protect those risk assessments, we need that further guidance in schools um, to support those, those, those TAs, those teachers who are experiencing um, this unwanted uh, um, from, from children, um, which can be very, very difficult, very stressful. And again, within that guidance as well, the support going forward um, for those pupils. So I've discussed this and uh, I think it's, it's been agreed that we need to look at, but I'd like to see that come back to this um, committee uh, report on that extra work. Thank you. Especially around a, a restorative justice, that type of stuff with, with, with children. Before I ask Emma to uh, respond, because she's sort of hand up on that one. As a governor of school, primary school, uh, one and all members, I am aware that uh, head teachers are far too often reporting to their governors uh, of the different incidences uh, um, that seem to have increased over the last few years when schools have gone through such, and the children uh, in those schools have gone through a very, very difficult time uh, in and out, in and out, and knowing their teachers as well as they once used to. Uh, so breakdown in communication and uh, all, all of those other things have not made it easier for uh, the schools, uh, parents as well probably, and certainly the, the younger children in how they should behave in school at all times they want. So can't argue with uh, those comments at all, uh, Juan. Emma. Thank you, Chair. Um, first, if I could just respond to Councillor Emright. Um, first thing I'd say is in terms of um, highlighting changes, what we can do, we usually have a, a track change version. So, so I wouldn't want to send it out in, in the pack, but when we are putting a report that's been revised to come to committee, we can we can send it out in advance to make it really easy for you to see what the track changes are. And I think that probably links in with um, with your second point, Councillor M. Right, and and I will absolutely take it on the chin. You know your your dots and the the things that you've picked up, the the wording changes. That was probably my fault. Probably rushing to accept all of the track changes, and actually at that stage it should have been proofread and gone back um, for for formatting. So I think that's you know a good point that we will we will certainly sometimes times time scales can get a little bit tight and I think that's one for me to focus on to make sure that I build in enough time to accept those changes, proofread and actually send it back for formatting so that when it comes to you, it shouldn't be six or seven items. They might always be the one because, you know, we're all human, but it should be the exception rather than the rule. So, so we'll take all of those points will ensure that they are factored in going forward and factored into this report. Um, and, and obviously going forward, we can send you the track changes version. So it would be really easy to see what's going to change. Great stuff. Thanks for that. Thanks, Emma. I've also got to add my own comments uh, on that. Uh, normally, I will go through things and pick up uh, missing words and too many commas or, or full stops in, in inappropriate places. Um, I haven't given this particular report enough time this time. Uh, so I, I must remind myself to uh, do that. And I, hopefully I could have picked up some of those things in advance of, uh, of the, the meeting actually commencing. So thanks, Gary, and thanks for taking that on the chin, uh, Emma. Uh, thanks for your comments as well, Juan. And I'll, I'll be voting on the updated policy one on this one. Emma? 
I, I think what what CMT wanted was just the comments reflected and to go I, back I, to them. Before we move on, though, Councillor Adams, could I, could I respond to um um to Juan as well in terms in terms of his his points? Because again, um obviously it did go to union consultation and we had a really good discussion. And and I think Juan makes some very very good points. It's not an easy one, um because as you've already pointed out. Um, we are dealing with very, very difficult situations and children that are sometimes been through some particular challenges and COVID has, has really um, layered on those challenges and it makes it very difficult to manage um, because we've got a legal duty to educate, but we've also got a legal responsibility to keep our staff safe and, and it's, it's is balancing, balancing those two effectively without compromising either of them. Um, and I think what we agreed uh, at the union meeting, at the consultation meeting, was that health and safety would meet with, with Sarah Ellis as, as head of inclusion to look at how we could frame some guidance um, because schools do need the tools and they need to be clear processes and it doesn't need to be captured in the policy which 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 the unions agreed with because actually the the processes are in the policy but schools need to be clear on on um, their responsibilities around protecting staff, around communication, um, and, and people have got different tolerances toward work-related violence as well. And that's not to say that any work-related violence is acceptable, um, but sometimes it does depend on, on people's perceptions, and that's very difficult to capture in any document. So it, it is a really challenging one, but one that we're committed to work with colleagues um, to move forward on, to keep everybody safe. That, that's correct. Um, and I, I'm aware, of course, it, they're not there in school just to protect staff from the children, but from children from other children. Absolutely. It, it's really so wide ranging. I've got Lynn Donovan now who uh, wanted to come in. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. J just um, if it helps to remind members, um, this committee is one of the important parts of the consultation for the process for these policies. Um, we've, as Juan has said, we've already consulted with the trade union. We'll go back into the corporate management team now with comments from this committee, and then it'll go on to cabinet for approval. So just in case it, it helped members, just um, to be clear that it's cabinet that agree these policies. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lynn. So back to 3.2, the recommendation, and uh, it's... Do it every three years, and that back into there. Members to comment on the report and provide feedback as they deem necessary. We've certainly done that. Any feedback from the committee will be submitted along with the report to a future CMT, and we've had comments and commitments that that will happen as well. So it's been moved and seconded. Uh, but can I ask members to vote on that? And again, this is, of course, for all members can vote on that. It's not the minute. Again, do you want to put your hands up, members, in favour? Chair, sure, sorry, it's Julie from Committee Services. No, I'm, I'm not aware that there was a vote. Um, no. For this, um, <clears throat> No, probably on the vote, but uh, OK, I, I, I'm in favour that uh, recommendations are forwarded as well. So thank, thanks, members. I, I, I will continue to learn. OK, so we now go on to item number seven. This is a presentation. And again, is that from, from Emma or any of your support staff on the training update, Emma? Uh, thank you, Councillor Adams. I'm going to hand this one over to Ali Evans, who's our Principal Health and Safety Trainer, and she's going to give you a brief presentation to bring you up to date with our training um, priorities and, and where we are heading with, with the, the Health and Safety Training Team. OK, thanks, Emma. Over to you, Ali. Thank you, Chair. I will endeavour to share the presentation with you all. Hopefully, you can see those slides. 
Yep. OK. OK, so just to give you uh, an update on our uh, training activity within the Health and Safety Division. So I've used in true training style some visual aids, some verbal information and some statisticals. So hopefully I'll engage all of you with your different learning styles. Uh, but it is just to basically update you on what uh, we are currently doing and what we're looking to do going forward. So for, particularly for the newer members of the committee, um, we run um, a number of training interventions linked into health and safety subjects. So we have a directory that advertises a portfolio of over 28 courses. So they are wide ranging um, from things like asbestos training, first aid, loan working, uh, premises management and so on and so forth, um, all linked to be able to deliver across the, the organisation to meet needs. One of the other things that we can and do is to support with refresher training. So with many of the health and safety topics, there will always be a legal responsibility and obligation to deliver refresher training to ensure that skills and knowledge are current. And so our training admin function that supports the, the training delivery will look at this and where we can remind service areas of um, their need to refresh the training. So for example, year on year, we ensure that over 200 uh, housing staff, housing operatives, receive their asbestos annual training. That uh, responsibility does still sit with each service area, but we will support and remind where we are able to. One of the, I guess, added values of having the internal um, provision of, of training within the authority is that we can tailor our packages and we do strive to do this for a number of programmes um, and it helps to ensure that every service area gets what they need in terms of the training. So a few examples of that is where we've delivered uh, perhaps manual handling um, where we do this for a service area. We will go to the service area, we'll utilise um, their resources, do it on site. So that helps um, them to understand uh, how it affects them, if you like, in their own area of work. More recently, um, following a review of processes and training needs, we delivered loan working safely and dealing with conflict in the workplace for the planning uh, team and building control. So that helped them in terms of some of their site visits and some of the issues that they have there. So we are able to tailor these things to make sure we're meeting the needs of the service and organisation. Uh, record keeping is, is essential um, and we share the, the iTrend platform, so it's the one that HR use and we use the same to uh, record all of our training activity and that allows employees as individuals to access the learning accounts and it allows managers to look at what training has been undertaken and we can re produce reports on that. So again, that helps us to, uh, to identify what needs to be done and what has been done. We also work in close partnership with um, other local authorities and other uh, the bodies as well as delivering for Caerphilly staff. So to give some examples, we deliver asbestos training for the Cardiff and Vale Health Board. Uh, we've been doing that for a number of years. We've been delivering asbestos training with Welsh Water and their partners, Morgan Sindel. We deliver a range of programmes for Merthyr Council. And more recently, we've been delivering some managing safety programmes for Newport Council. Uh, we did look to sort of strengthen that relationship by exploring the possibility of a service level agreement where Caerphilly would recruit an additional trainer and we would then um, use the income from charges to Newport to uh, to help with that post. Uh, unfortunately, like many others, we were uh, unsuccessful in recruitment, so we won't rule it out going forward. We are happy to explore again, but at the moment we will just continue to support those other agencies and partners um, as we can, as we are able with the resource, but keeping Caerphilly obviously as our main focus for delivery. So the current approach is that we align ourselves uh, with the workforce development and wellbeing strategies. So workforce development, of course, is looking at training, making sure it's fit for purpose, it's aligning with business needs. And equally important, the wellbeing strategy, where some of the key points have been highlighted around health, physical, social, uh, mental well-being. So, of course, we can play an important part with some of our training interventions, um, which is, you know, the, the health and well-being of, of our staff is, of course, you know, critical to the business delivery. And so we have been looking at some of the key 
uh, findings of the wellbeing strategy where for a number of years, things like musculoskeletal disorders, neck, back, uh, shoulder pain, stress related cases have contributed to absences. And so it's about linking in with our training interventions to try and take a proactive approach to assist with some of these areas. Of course, we link into our own uh, team's uh, health and safety action plan. So we find that when officers are out uh, carrying out inspections and audits, meeting with staff, talking to managers, it invariably will generate training needs. So we look then to meet those needs. Um, I think we're all aware that more recently we've all had to respond to emergency situations and what the training element can do is, is direct resources to be able to respond to some of these. Um, COVID was a, a good example where the demand for first aid training increased hugely because schools in particular, the service areas were finding it difficult to staff that responsibility. So we came up with some alternative solutions around training. And um, not that we like to think that we get it wrong very often, but if there have been contraventions in any health and safety, we can look to then address any training needs that might be relevant. So more recently, we've linked in with housing to look at uh, dust control and prevention and delivering some training around that. Um, we also support uh, what we would call local training needs analysis. So dealing with service areas, talking to the managers, identifying where those gaps are and being able to respond. And sometimes it's not possible for us to meet those needs internally. But what we will then do is look for an external provision that is suitable, that is compliant and assist managers to source that training as well. So the focus at the moment, to give you some detail on this, we are currently looking to um, secure an external provider to look at some CDM, construction design management training. Um, it isn't something that we have the expertise necessarily in our team to deliver, and it is going to be a wide reaching program. So we're working at the moment to look for an appropriate um, training provider. Just recently, we have successfully delivered a number of briefings on the duty to manage asbestos in schools. So this was a, a mandatory requirement for heads and deputies across all of our school portfolio where asbestos is present. That was a successful uh, rollout and we've arranged a mop up for a new school term just to catch those last few that are unable to attend. And that links in to the asbestos condition monitoring training that we've been putting together. So we've created a video that people can access via a YouTube link alongside some guidance. Um, and I'm sure Emma will update you, but it's, it's very timely um, in line with the HSC announcement. They intend to uh, look at asbestos management in schools in England and Wales um, over the coming months. So that's one thing that's, that's linked in very nicely to that, uh, that aim. Uh, we've been streamlining our first aid guidance and TNA, and again, looking at alternative ways of meeting the, the needs of delivery. Um, and COVID has impacted on that, but we've managed to secure resources and we, we're improving all the time the way that we're delivering first aid to make sure that we reach everybody we need to. Again, pandemic has had an impact in terms of our training for residential care homes and evacuation chair training is uh, something that's very important for their fire prevention um, and action strategies. So we've embarked upon an, an ambitious programme recently to get as many of those staff trained. It hasn't come without its problems. We've had COVID outbreaks, we've had um, staffing issues, but we are working closely with the homes to, uh, to continue uh, and complete that rollout. I mentioned earlier the um, dust control and prevention work that we've been doing with housing. So we dovetailed that with the annual asbestos training. So it was a bit of a sort of a Tesco buy one, get one free, where we brought them in. So to minimise operational um, impact, if you like, we covered both of these elements in one training session to make sure that they were up to date and compliant. And we also carried out a scoping exercise with highways looking at fit testing. So this is in particular reference to the respiratory protective equipment needed to protect them from silica dust. So we've done some um, really good work in that area. And we're also expanding our approach for the manual handling train the trainer. So this allows service areas to develop and, and um, 
sort of qualify their own trainers with our support to deliver um, a package that we've approved. And it just means that lots of these service areas can deliver in a way that's um, less impact on their service. It's more timely. So, for example, Clan Kaig Vow, lots and lots of casual part time staff working outside of normal hours. So their trainer can pick those people up to make sure that they are trained. And we're currently looking at exploring this option with parks and with the library service. So it just ensures the training is being delivered, but it can be delivered at a local level uh, suitable for that service area. So just to give you an update on the statistics uh, of where we're at from uh, the last year of training, and you can see there that we've been busy. So lots and lots of training, lots of delegates over or near 2000 there. Um, and some of those are external, but of course the focus remains that we are um, delivering training to our, our Kafili staff. Little surprise to you perhaps that the largest customer there is education and corporate services. Um, I believe they account for about 40% of the workforce, so that uh, that's no surprise. Areas like communities, uh, whilst we deliver some of the more corporate genetic packages, of course, some of their training is very specialised. So it either happens in-house or it's delivered by an external provider. And social services also have their own workforce development uh, team. So again, lots of their training is delivered by their in-house programme as well. But we still continue to deliver across the board. Um, and I'm sure the numbers for the uh, for the forthcoming year will be as, uh, as successful. So going forward, um, some of the things that um, Emma and Andy and I and the team have discussed to focus on, we will continue to deliver the status quo because it works, um, having classroom training and, and on-site training. But equally, we want to ensure that we are meeting everyone's needs. So we're going to be engaging more with our partners and looking to support them. Again, this will link into some training needs analysis guidance that we've been producing. So that will be ready uh, to go out shortly. And it's it's almost like a toolkit for managers to help them identify what health and safety training needs they have. Um, and then where required, we will meet with them to work through that and to look at how we can meet those needs. We will continue to strengthen our links with external partners, uh, sharing information and resources with our neighbouring authorities, um, of course, brings its benefits. Um, and we will continue to do that going forward. And then also, um, I guess, as one of the successes coming out of a pandemic, we have explored other training intervention means or mediums. So blended learning is definitely the way forward. Not everything has to be classroom. Lots of things can be delivered digitally. And we have been expanding our um, resources of training videos that we upload to the intranet. So again, effective, efficient, less uh, operational impact, but still meeting our needs to ensure that we are, we are compliant. And of course, most importantly, keeping our staff uh, safe and well. So that's the focus and that's what we uh, will continue to work hard towards. So if anybody has any questions, please do ask. Thank you very much for that, Ali. Uh, very, very concise uh, and, and very well delivered to the, the, the point that we all need to know. Ongoing is what we're all about. Learn from what we've done ongoing to improve. Couple of questions from our questioners of, of right. Gary Enright first, and again followed by Juan. Gary, sure, just a just a couple, or, or Ali actually. Um, great presentation. Thanks for that. There were a couple of acronyms within the presentation that I I wouldn't know what they've meant. So, is there any chance next time we do a presentation, we can have sort of something on the back end to say that. RPE stands for, uh, CDM stands for, because I think that would be useful rather than trying to work it out. Um, I'm just curious, on the refresher training, how do you quantify that the learner has understood what has been taught? Is there feedback sheets at the end? Is there tests? Um, I'll give you an example of a manual handling course. Does everybody, everybody pass? In other words, have you just got to attend and you pass or do you highlight some concerns and that's fed back into 
um, the supervision process, our managers involved. So it's those kinds of things that I'm I'm interested in. Thanks, yeah, Gary. Yes, um, and some of those. Uh, yeah, you, you, you can't do a course and immediately think or be thought of as having learned all that was there. Now, Ali, I'm sure you've got some answers for that. Hopefully. So, yes, great questions, Gary. Um, in terms of the uh, the abbreviations and acronyms, uh, I did verbalise them, but of course, yes, we uh, we take for granted that everybody will understand. So we will uh, we will make sure that, that happens going forward. Um, in terms of training interventions and assessment, every... Um, Every subject matter really can vary in terms of what you need to achieve. So some things will be instruction only, policy briefings, for example. So you wouldn't necessarily uh, assess understanding and learning. Um, however, with all training, you should evaluate the impact that it has. So we uh, carry out evaluation forms, feedback forms for some courses there will be a formal assessment. So for example, the IOSH Managing Safely, it requires the candidates or delegates to complete a project, to complete a, a, quest, a set of questions and assessment as a formal exam. So they are marked by an external body. Um, internally, things like um, loan working, we will do some exercise at the end to ensure understanding. Again, that's followed up with evaluation forms. So it really does depend on the subject matter and, um, you know, who the audience are, we will and have and do um, feedback to managers where we have any uh, issues to raise, any concerns. So, for example, um, if we're delivering asbestos training, we will bring apprentices through um, and they take part. But we would always then recommend back to the foreman that they don't undertake in any asbestos works until they are obviously qualified. Uh, if we've got any concerns around understanding, you know, we do have delegates that um, maybe have limited literacy skills. So we take all of those things into account and feedback where appropriate. Thanks, Ali. Great stuff. Thanks for that. Hi, Jay. Did you just call me in? Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah, thanks, Ali. Thanks for that. Um, I'm, are these ready available on the internet so staff can can access them? Yeah, I thought so. Um, one th one thing with yeah, I've, I know I've, I've mentioned this before, and it's it's it's, it's a big issue for me. Is fire fire risk uh, assessment, you know, with with more people working at home, agile working, a lot of us joining today. You know, we've seen some recent incidents. You know, that have been quite uh, well broadcasted. Um, and, and taking it back to, to, to fire and, you know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, when your workplace, uh, your home becomes your workplace, you know, those risk assessments should carry out and we should have some. So I think it'd be um, good. I don't know if there's anything planned to have some to extend that that sort of training, you know, for example, to have a fire risk assessment for your own house that you can carry out. I know if you contact the South Wales Fire Service, they quite happily come in and, and, and conduct one for you. It's just those simple things that you might not think when you're working in a back office, you know, and you might leave, you know, computer on or someone's cooking in the other room and go out and you're stuck, you know, action plan. Um, so I'd just like to raise that again. Thank you. Uh, just in response to that, when the um, when people started to work from home, we did create a video that was aimed around DSE, but also um, communicated the home working risk assessment form that users needed to complete. And it does take into account other hazards, but I'm sure Emma will uh, will expand on that for you. Yes, Emma's got her hand up, ready to come in on probably exactly that question and uh, a few others maybe. Emma. Uh, absolutely. Just to add on to what Ali says, there is a checklist, not only a DSE checklist, but a working from home checklist, which which does direct employees to consider the risks associated with their home, including thinking about how to get out uh, in the event of a fire. Um, it is a very difficult balance because we don't have the same control or, in fact, responsibilities in terms of home environments um, and employees now who choose to work from home um, have got their own responsibilities too. It is a really difficult one. I, I can't imagine a situation where we would ever be able to go out and evaluate um, individuals' homes from either a fire or a health and safety perspective. Um, if I just took um, the fire perspective, then capacity-wise, um, 
you can't get fire risk assessment fire risk assessors for love nor money um we we've got a responsibility to prioritize our higher risk buildings um obviously res care um day center schools um and we've got a program of doing fire risk assessments in in those buildings and other workplaces um but what we do instead is is as as ali says direct people and give them the tools um signpost them and encourage them to think about their environment and and to plan and arrange it to to be safe then thanks emma just just one question i remember when i first had my laptop at home many years ago now uh, a, a dse was certainly uh, handed uh, now you're doing that right and this right do we do an updated one for councillors? There's no one specifically for councillors, but what I would say, Councillor Adams, is, is the standard guidance, um, the video that Ali refers to, the checklist, that will take you through the process. And if, if having carried out an assessment in line with the process, you've got concerns, then we would be happy to, to discuss with you. Um, I know um, Rianne on me has, has, I think, met with a leader already um, and, and, and um, gone through a DSE assessment. So, so we would support you in the same way as we would support any other employee. So if you've got any concerns and you've been through the checklist and, and you're not sure about something, then, then we, we will arrange to discuss with you and, and look at the right course of action. Okay, thank you very much, Emma. Right, no other questions uh, indicated. So can I thank you very much for that presentation, Ali? It, uh, as uh, Gary uh, and Wanbo said, thank you very much for the way that it was presented and uh, the, the questions uh, you, you took on board so, so easily and I hope answered for, for all of us. Thank you very much, Ali. And there's no vote on that one, uh, members. So if you'd like to put the screen back as it was, remove your present your sharing. Yeah, thanks, Ali. Okay, members. To receive and consider the following information items. Eight, recent health and safety executive updates. Anything that we really, really, really need to know, uh, Emma? Uh, I don't think so, Councillor Adams. The report is pretty self-explanatory yeah. and, and it is for information only. That's it, yeah, okay. Accident statistic report for January to March, item number nine. Again, anything in there that uh, you need to comment on apart from the, the, the information in the report? I'd say not. Again, it is for, for information only. And as far as I'm aware, no questions have been raised in advance on either of these reports. Okay. Members, any any questions from the reports that you've, uh, you've looked at? Gary. Yeah, just just curious, really. Uh, agenda item eight, just to go back, you you whizzed past that one, sir. I did didn't even see you do it. Um, recent health and safety executive updates. Just curious, anything from Wales? Because there seems to be quite a lot from up country, you know, northwest, that kind of thing. Is there anything from Wales that we should be aware of? Can I come in there, chair? Yes, of course. Um, Gary, no, not specifically. When we put together the reports, we look at, obviously, if there is anything local, then that grabs the attention um, better than anything from any anywhere more geographically distant. Um, but we look at anything that, that would be relevant. Um, so no, nothing of interest um, from Wales. We will be looking to expand that report possibly to add in um, any relevant civil cases um, going forward. Uh, the only thing that I, that I would bring your attention to, there isn't in the report, but might be worth you being, being aware of. Ali alluded to the fact that we had information late last week that the health and safety executive will be carrying out a, a programme of inspections around management of asbestos in schools. That's from September. 
Um, so we'll be communicating with all of our schools today and just reminding them um, to, to get make sure not to get their house in order because I've certainly gone nothing to evidence that their processes are not absolutely robust. But a timely reminder around making sure that your documents are present and, and your risks are communicated and managed never goes uh, never goes wrong then. Great stuff. Thanks for that. My additional question is agenda item nine, and I'm just curious on this one. And it's not to put anyone on the spot. Somebody can come back to me. Um, Lim B status employees, um, which are generally self-employed. Um, I'm mindful of recent case that went to the High Court, where certain individuals um, argued that their single self-employed status was solely with one employer. And as such, the employer negated their responsibility for PPE. So the question I've got really, have we got any uh, self-employed employees? If so, how many? And is there any way that we can, you know, make sure that Kefili are not their standalone yeah. employer? Because if that is the case, we might lead ourselves into a bit of a uh, bit of a pickle. Um, I'm mindful that I've got the paperwork here. Um, but, but independent trade union, you, you don't hear a lot from this trade union, but when you do, uh, people generally sit up and notice. Uh, the Independent Workers Union of Great Britain, the IWGB, and it was a case that they brought before the High Court, and as a consequence of that, there was a judicial review, which I'm assuming is, you know, manifested itself in, in your report there, Emma. But I'm just curious as to the self-employed employees with Kefili. Can I come in there, Chair? Of course, Emma. Um, again, Gary, I need to go back and check, but from memory, this is something, and Andy might be able to help me out here, this is something that we looked at earlier this year in view of that very case. And I want to say, because my memory's a little bit woolly without checking, I want to say we looked at whether we had anybody that fell within those categories, um, and 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 we didn't. I can see Andy's got his hand up. Andy may remember a little bit better than I can, but I I can remember the conversations and the emails, but I can't remember the detail without checking. Right before I I call in Andy, one is your question directly related to. Uh, whatever answer we might get yeah i go on then one yeah we, we we did look at this i mean and um early in the year and 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 the, the member staff and i think the conclusion was that regardless of who the employer was whether if they work in um on a completely better site or conducting completely business they would be subject to to the the implementation obviously of, of pp and um and expected to to, to to be following that um yeah however there is there is one uh, incident actually that, that we're looking at at the moment and i mean when we're looking at them on this, this week um that is coming to to light um which will have a crossover um we have members in schools who are agency um employed and there's an anomaly there under safeguarding if there's an issue, um, you know, as a neutral act, those members will be um, suspended in some cases if they're following a risk assessment and a, a multi-agency meeting. Now, within some of the contracts of the agency, um, which we're reply, reply, re, relying on more than more um, uh, because of sh staff shortages, um, within their contracts, they're not paid if they're suspended. And we know these suspensions can take, you know, the, the time scale, especially if they're referred to the police, can take, you know, 12 months plus, um, which really is career ending to those those staff. And I won't be questioned that with some of the agencies. Some of the agencies are coming back and saying, well, those members are self-employed. Um, so we've got to question that as well. So that's a bigger picture. So there's an overlap there where there could be, um, uh, yeah, uh, you know where they are the self-employed so asking if we got self-employed members working in, in Kefili then you know if we're to take them uh, at face value then we then we have so we need to look at that and I think this is an issue that needs to be looked at anyway under health and safety 
bracket because obviously then it becomes a health and safety issue because where you've got an incident that if you report could be career ending to yourself there might be just a little thing in the back of your mind that i'll let this one go so um you know we, we need to be looking at those agencies that are having conversations with these agencies or actually should we be working with agencies that are not giving that full protection to those staff because you know it is a very very real um, everyday occurrence now that when you walk into a school you could be not walking back in for 12 months or so um just because we need to follow those safeguarding issues so a bit of an overlap there not exactly on the thing but i was going to bring that in, in under any other business because i do see that as a health and safety issue then when we look in um and we're also getting reports while I'm on the subject, if you just uh, um, allow me, Chair. Um, again, with agency staff, getting a lot of reports coming in from schools that are getting untrained or very young and experienced staff. So actually, when they step into schools, they're taken away um, because they've got to be um, they've got to be tutored by other staff and other TAs, which actually is having a detrimental effect on what they're trying to achieve within those schools. Thank you. That ended up at what it's very wide ranging compared to the just the information uh, report, which of course Gary properly uh, asked a question about, and uh, you then added on to that. Uh, that well, uh, ask Andrew has he got any comments based on that particular issue of self-employed staff within Kofili for however long they do it? Yeah, Andrew. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so the the law did change on the first of April this year. Um, I'm not aware whether that was as a direct consequence of the case that's been referred to or not, um, but it does change the law um, a little bit. Um, the, the existing law still applies, um, but there was a change in the law in terms of where you have um, people on like a self-employed um, kind of basis. So um, a communication was sent out um, I believe via management network. Um, I'm not aware of the specifics um, if we had any employees falling into this category. Um, from the feedback that um, I'm aware of, I don't think we had any. Um, that may be something that HR may be able to look into um, and clarify, but I believe that um, there are none. So I can see Lynn's got her hand up, so maybe I'll provide that clarification. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Juan, you've still got your hand up. Yeah, sorry, Chair. I'll take that down. And uh, Andrew, Lynn, Lynn Donovan. Thank you, Chair. If I can just pick up on some of what's been asked, if that's OK. Um, whether we employ somebody engaged in via an agency or they are self-employed, they should be subject to the risk assessments in place for that service. So any PPE required should be in place for them, not just um, because they're employees. So um, I, I hope I can clarify that with um, the committee. Um, the queries that Juan has raised are queries that I'm familiar with because we're having those discussions. Um, our contract is with the agency. Um, and they are not employees of the council. So should they be asked to refrain from the workplace, then there are, you know, there are different um, factors in place for our own staff. We have our terms and conditions. These workers are engaged by an agency. Um, self-employed is something different as well. There's a process called IR35 that any self-employed person would need to go through. I can see some of you shaking your heads. And um, the issue around IR35 is that that should be for people who are not undertaking the work that an employee would undertake. Um, so we shouldn't have anybody who's undertaking the functions of a TA that's self-employed, because that's clearly something that an employee would do or via an agency. Um, while I noticed you, you commented that some of the agencies have stated that the workers that they are providing to us are self-employed. I'd be really grateful if outside of this meeting you could email me the details of those agencies, please, so that we can um, work with them. Um, just for members' information, we have a corporate framework um, around agency workers that would apply to each of our directorates, but not for schools. Schools have a different um, process they work within where they can engage agency workers directly. So hopefully that's brought clarity to some of the questions asked. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Lynn. 
Okay, Fun, your hand is still up. Another question or is that a legacy hand now? You build. Just want to come back to, to Lenana. Yes, we will we'll, we'll definitely send those to those those to you all get done this week. Um, yes, yeah, I just think you know as a, as health and safety can be a concern as well. You know when we when we sit within safeguarding, you know it's just the little gaps. You know can can lead to massive consequences for for for, for, for children. You know, and I think you know that we really need to be you know shoring up those the, those gaps and. You know, as, a, as an authority, you know, when we employ an agency staff to come in, and some of those staff they might be suspended because of a third party. They not may not be actually directly related to them. But I think you know, there is an opportunity for us to keep if that is their policy, and we can't change that. And and and, and that is a policy of all agencies. You know, there's a, a difficulty there. But we have we have got the um you know the ability to keep paying for that individual to those agencies, so they remain effectively employed while a proper um, effective investigation goes on and let's 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 be clear we need those investigations to go on so whatever comes up at the end you know we don't lose those those staff who could you know if there was you know if they if, if they are subject to that investigation and and it comes out at the end that there was a case to answer that they haven't slipped through the net and they're now working in a neighboring authority or somewhere else okay Thanks, Juan. Yeah, yeah, those points are very relevant. We need to know as much as we can about everyone who comes within our review. And uh, I'm sure those incidences are at the top, or some, somewhere near the top of both Emma and, and Lynn's purview. Uh, we do what we do as best we can. Okay. Thank you very much, members. There are no more questions on there. We've come to the end of tonight's of tonight's I don't know where the hell I am uh, of, of today's uh, health and safety meeting. Um, hopefully, the new members will be looking forward to the next meeting and looking at uh, how different and how wide the breadth of uh, the organisation is covered and how much of that information you are made aware of and need to make decisions on in, in the future as we go forward. So thank you very much for all who've attended uh, this morning's meeting. And uh, Juan, your hand's gone back up. Yeah, Chair, just under any other business, if you will. Uh, that's exactly on the, uh, the agenda, I don't think. Uh, but if you've got a comment that you, you might think uh, uh, would be of interest to the committee, please uh, go forward. Yes, Jay. In, in light of the, obviously the, the the exceptional weather that we're we're experiencing at the moment, I'd just like if we can have an update on any measures that we've implemented for our staff, you know, um, bin men and etc. out there on the on the roads, you know, uh, for for extremely long times and doing very arduous work in these conditions. Um, just on that, and also I'm gonna I'd like to say you know as well um, under the menopause guidance um, again you know as a trade union we're pushing for a policy on this, and again this would be you know where the policy would be more effective than than guidance in its effect because obviously there's going to be you know it's, a, it's it's only one element of the menopause symptoms but a very you know. Um, detrimental one to, to, to anyone experiencing that and if there was you know a policy or you know some, some direct that, that you know that, that could kick in when we have exceptional unforeseen circumstances thank you on, on the uh, the weather thing of course we've already had an email saying that in men are starting at five o'clock uh, for the next two days it is the next two days enough uh, who knows uh, on that one um Emma, quick comment. Uh, I would say that we've sent out some all user guidance via comms. We worked with 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 Lynn and Steve Pugh to, to draft something appropriate. Um, it is down to managers to review their risk assessments and their plans and, and to take reasonable steps. We wouldn't have all of the information here on, on what's been done, um, but we send out a very clear message that, that, that the safety of our staff is paramount um, and, and the weather certainly needs to be factored into those considerations, into those assessments. 
Councillor Chapman has hand up, Chair. Yes, I'm just going to call the oh. Rob before I come over to, to Lynn Donovan. Rob? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it's concerning the warm weather work end policy. Naturally, with the weather as it is now, um, could I have a copy of the policy or the risk assessments of what we've got in place concerning the outside, especially the outside staff, you know, the who are working out in this extreme heat, what uh, we have got for them? Yeah. I.e. Oh. sunblock or, or, what, or water given to the staff? Right. And uh, Emma's got her hand up uh, and uh, comment, Emma? Just, just to say that there isn't a policy, there's guidance, because obviously there's a risk assessment policy, so so it would come under the requirement to to assess the risk. There's guidance, which which I can certainly uh, send over to you, Councillor Chapman, on working outdoors in the sun, and I can also forward you the email that was sent out on Friday. If you had concerns in terms of what's going on in a particular area, then we can certainly ask those questions and and forward you the relevant information. Um. Thank you, Emma. No, it's just that in this extreme heat, you know, um, especially the refuse workers, grounds maintenance workers, housing workers, who are actually out there for a number of hours in this particular heat, is to make sure that we've got in place to, uh, to support them with the correct um, what they need, you know, okay. i.e. sunblock, caps. What we basically say is the things that you've said there. We say think about the working patterns, think about whether you can start early and finish later and flexibility, um, encourage staff to wear hats and to keep covered up um, because obviously the temptation can be, um, you know, to take to take top off and working outside and obviously we, we, we want coverage because we, we could have sunburn. We would, we would certainly encourage the application of high factor sun cream repeatedly throughout the day. Um, we encourage staff to take to stay hydrated and to take regular breaks. Uh, some service areas will, will certainly, particularly for outside workers, will be um, providing water and making sure that these things actually happen because it's it's, it's not just telling, it's, it's around supervision as well, you know. Yeah. Thank you, Emma, for that. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Emma. Lynn, you want to come in possibly on uh, Juan's uh, second question? Just um, to clarify, really, um, Chair, we managers have been looking at risk assessments and for um, the staff that are frontline, you may have seen on social media that our refuse crews have started earlier, so they're not going to be working during the peak heat during, uh, during today and tomorrow. Um, if you look at services like our care homes, they, they have to work 24-7, so managers there are working hard to look at how they can remain cool, but keeping it warm enough for the residents, how they remain hydrated, looking at appropriate clothing. So those risk assessments are done in individual service areas. It's part of the business continuity plans within um, each of the services to look at how they can operate. You know, we, early this year we had extreme winds, we've had really bad floods. Um, I think, to be fair, they have to be... We, be prepared for every eventuality and we will keep them as up to date as possible with relevant guidance as well. Um, with regard to Juan's comments around a menopause policy, we do have guidance in place uh, for managers and staff around the menopause. Um, and these are individual discussions individuals need to have with their managers as to their own needs because each person um, their circumstances will be different so we couldn't have a blanket approach so whether it's a policy or guidance it's important that managers and staff are talking about any of these issues that affect their staff and what we can do to support them in the workplace thank you chair thank you lynn okay there we are there are no more questions no more any other business, uh, we'll have to look at that when uh, one for future future meetings. Um, but thank you all for attending this morning again, and uh, I hope it's enthused uh, the newer members to want to come and listen to many more of these uh, presentations and information items that uh, we have throughout the year. Thank you all very much for attending. Thank you, Chair.